So I thought I'd organize my sort of brief remarks this morning around a couple of things. First, I wanted to just share with you what I consider to be sort of five important facts about the state of food and agriculture in this country. I think there's an implicit idea in these sorts of panels that when we're talking about food and eating sustainably, that, that we want things to be different. And I think if we want to talk about how we want to change, we have to understand the present and the current trends we're on. So I'm going to talk about those. And then I'm also going to just conclude with you know, sort of five key takeaways from my perspective here. So what are some of the key you know, sort of facts, at least from my perspective, about the state of food and farming? First is that today's farmers in this country uh, produce a lot more food using many fewer resources than farmers did in the past. Now, that's just another way of saying that farms today are incredibly productive. In fact, agriculture has experienced one of the highest rates of productivity growth of any sector in the U.S. economy over the last 100 years or so. And what do we mean by productivity growth? Basically, it's the amount of output farms are producing on the numerator, and on the de denominator is, the, is all of the inputs that are going into producing that agriculture. It's land, it's labor, it's capital. And so it's the ability to produce more using less. And so the other corollary sort of fact of that is if you're more productive, you can have less environmental impacts, fewer environmental impacts. So for example, if you look at the data, things like greenhouse gas emissions per bushel or per acre or per animal have uh, fallen pretty dramatically over time. And you can see these in a lot of different data sets. So this is USDA data on agricultural productivity growth since the 1940s, late 1940s. And you can see um, agricultural outputs increased almost 170% over that time period. We've increased that output at the same time that we've reduced uh, land use by about 26% and labor use by about 76%. So again, absolutely incredible ga gains in productivity growth. But you look at these kind of pictures and sometimes it's hard to put that in like a context that makes sort of real world sense. Like what does this mean on the ground in terms of how agriculture works? So here's a little graph I put together for a little piece I had in the New York Times where I tried to do a little bit of a thought experiment. And in this thought experiment, I asked, you know, what if we wanted to eat the same amount of beef or dairy that we actually consume now, but instead we did that using 1950s technology? And when you do that sort of thought experiment, what you find out is if we wanted to enjoy the same amount of beef we eat today, but we're using 1950s technology, we need 15 million more beef cows. That's literally cows. That doesn't even count the steers and heifers because there's one good data going back that far. We need 30 million more dairy cows. We need about 228 million more acres of corn, uh, about 100 million more acres of soybeans, about twice or double the amount of, of acres to produce wheat. So, you know, when you look at it in this terms, it tells you what innovation and productivity growth really mean. It means that we're able to enjoy a standard of living while using fewer of our natural resources around us. Um, the other thing that's sort of, you know, what, what's provided that productivity of growth, of course, has been changes in technology and innovation that have happened. But those have come about because farms have gotten a lot bigger and more efficient over time. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't quite realize because a lot of the discussion these days seems to center on smaller farms and what we can do to encourage that sm sm those small farms. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think if we want to talk about where food is produced, the food that we eat, we need to look at who is producing that food. So you look, again, if you look at USDA data, before about the 1950s, there were between six and seven million farms in this country. Today, there are about two million. But really, only about seven and a half percent of those farms account for any meaningful share of agricultural output. So there's only about 160,000 farms in this country that produce 80% of the value of ag output. Absolutely incredible. And when you, when you look at the size of these farms, they tend to be quite big. And they're, they're big on a scale that most of us have a hard time imagining. So for example, if you look at all the lettuce that's grown in this country, half that lettuce will be grown on farms that are at least 1,300 football fields in size. If you look at tomatoes, it's 620 football fields in size. Now I happen to grow about three uh, tomato plants in my backyard garden, you know, and I have a devil of a time keeping the disease and insects off of them, so I don't know how you do it when you have 620 football fields worth of tomato plants to worry about, but this is the size of the operations that today's farms see, and you can see it's, you know, similar uh, statistics there for wheat and corn. And the other important fact about these farms is, yes, some of them are corporate farms, but by and large, overwhelmingly, these are primarily still family-owned and operated operations. 
Um, I think it's also important to think about in the context of this discussion about productivity growth, that there's a lot of movement towards thinking about farming systems that restrict certain uses of technology or production systems. So organic would be a good example of that. And there's a lot of positive things I could say about organic, but the one thing I do want to point out here is that you know, anytime we, we use a production system that restricts certain practices and production techniques, by definition, it's a system that's going to be less productive. And I drew this little graph here because, you know, there's these debates, you know, do organic farms have higher or lower yields than uh, conventional farms? Uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear on that, but it's, you don't even have to look at the evidence. Just think about it conceptually. A, a, a conventional farmer has access to any technology an organic farmer does, but the reverse isn't true. And indeed, you can see it, like some of the practices that have been very successful in organic farming, like cover crops, certain no-till techniques, Conventional farmers will adopt those and have been adopting those. So, you, you know, conventional farmers can learn from organic, and they do. Um, and, but the, and, and the reverse is partly true, but not always because of this sort of restriction on what technologies uh, are, are accessible. The last and sort of uh, fifth, what I call food fact that I wanted to mention is that I think there's a tendency to look out at our agricultural system we have in the U.S. And when I read a lot of popular writing, people seem to say, well, this system we have is so irrational. We, we produce a lot of these commodity crops, a lot of livestock, it just doesn't make any sense. And there's these sort of thoughts that, well, it's just really bad government policy, all these farm subsidies, or these sort of evil corporations that are involved in agriculture. And some of those things are true, but the point I want you to, to get across is there are good reasons why agriculture is structured the way it is. I'm not gonna say it's perfectly rational, but what I'm gonna say is it's not irrational. And why is that true? Why do US farmers grow a lot of corn, wheat, soybeans, these sort of commodity crops? Crops. And the reason are that these particular crops are some of the world's most efficient converters of sunlight, energy, and nutrients in the soil to food we can eat. Not only are these crops highly efficient in converting solar energy to human edible energy, but they provide that energy in a form that's easily storable and easily transportable. So compare that, for example, to something like lettuce. We could probably all do well to eat a little more lettuce, but if you look at something like lettuce, it you know, does not do a good job converting solar energy to human energy, doesn't provide many calories, not much protein, virtually no, you know, no fat content, and it's very highly perishable uh, and not very storable. So I think you know, it's, it's important to understand why we grow the things we do. The other side of that is why do we eat a lot of meat? Well, one, you know, one answer is that, that what animals do is they convert those calories in things like corn and soybeans, and they turn it into a form of something that we actually want to eat. So they're, they're, in a way to think about it, they're machines that convert one form of calories into another that we uh, enjoy uh, as humans. And uh, I think the other important part of that to think about too, some of these animals, take cattle for example, um, take calories that are literally inaccessible to humans through grasses and convert them into high quality forms of protein. Of course, the downside is, you know, take something like a cow, cow, it's a ruminant, and that's both a blessing and a curse. The curse is being a ruminant, it creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. But the blessing is being a ruminant, they can take those calories from things like grasses and hay and convert them into a form of calories that we humans can eat. So the, the last sort of slide here, I have four key takeaways. I didn't know what, which way our discussion would go on the panel, so I wanted to make sure that I at least said these uh, earlier five things I wanted to say. And the first is, I think there's a lot of discussion about what it means to eat sustainably and what sustainable agriculture really means. And I think one of the things that's really missing from a lot of those discussions is uh, productivity growth. So I think an important thing from my perspective is that innovation, and productivity growth, in my mind, are cornerstones of improving uh, agricultural sustainability and should not be left out of that conversation. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I think this is a, a common statement of economists, but there are no silver bullets to solve our ag and food problems. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. I think in one of the sessions yesterday, the statement was said a little differently, like, you know, uh, you know there are problems, there are solutions, and those solutions create new problems. I think that's certainly true uh, in agriculture. And you could think about you know, this in a lot of different ways. So for example, we could, we, we could probably do well to improve our diets by eating a lot more fruits and vegetables, but it's not a free, free lunch. Fruits and vegetables, compared to some of these commodity crops, tend to use a little more water, often a lot, a lot more pesticides. And so it's, it's not that we can you know, solve all of our problems with a simple you know, solution or si single kind of farming system or kind of commodity. Um, this is the economist in me, but I think it's important to think on the margin, and what I mean by that is it's very common to see academic research that compares farm system A and to farm system B on the averages of things like land use and greenhouse gas emissions, but the real thing we want to know is what would happen if we changed from one to the other. What would happen in the conversion of one to the other, and those can give you very different 
sorts of uh, uh, interpretations. The one that's not up here that I wanted to mention that is also important to me is I think we spend a lot of times, the debate is about a lot of the technologies, like should we use GMOs? Uh, should we have large versus small farms? The, you know, those, that, that, those tend to be the lightning rods, but really I think what we want to pay attention to are the outcomes. Um, what, what happens in terms of, of the amount of land that's being required to produce a certain amount of food? What, what happens to, to greenhouse gas emissions for a certain amount of food? What's, what are the health impacts? The, the outcomes are really what we want to care about. The other things are just means to an end. And then lastly, um, I think it's important when we have discussions about food and agriculture that we involve those real life flesh and blood farmers, the people that I worked for as a kid when I was hoeing those cotton weeds. And, and not just any farmer, but those, you know, those 160,000 farmers that I mentioned that really do produce the bulk of the food. Often, we like to talk a lot about those people, but we don't actually engage them in the discussions that we have. But I'm at least pleased to see on this panel that I know Danny and Pedro spent a lot of their careers talking to real life farmers, and our moderator is a farmer herself. So I'm glad to see that we satisfied this last criteria here. Not the kind I like. <laughs> I like oysters, so anyway. Very good.